Basically about me. Um, my name is Dr. Brian Royer. Uh, I'm a board certified functional neurologist. I've got uh, plenty of hours of uh, in the diagnosis and treatment of multiple different neurological disorders um, and issues. Uh, I have a whole lot of time in on doing stuff with eye movements. So we have a bunch of different stuff that's going on. I also uh, certified chiropractic sports physician and a couple of other things. So basically what I'm saying is, is that we, you know, I've been doing lots of stuff with eye movements for a pretty long time. So it, it's a big part of uh, practice and how things work and how to actually like get people better in a lot of cases. So basically what it comes down to is is that you have you know vision is obviously one of the senses that we have we have multiple different senses but um it is one of the more important ones um basically we have coordination we have movement that has input that we need from our eyes in order to figure out what's going on um there's a lot of visual data that we use in order to make decisions and um uh, do things. So again, the, the, the faster that we process that visual data means that the more fluid or the more coordinated some of the movements and stuff can be. So this, depending on whether or not you're talking about throwing a ball accurately, or if somebody's trying to make a jump shot, or if you're just trying to talk about normal coordination, um, again, vision is going to be an important part of all of that. So basically, so again, you have multiple different things. Again, you need to make sure that you are looking at what you think that you're looking at and that your world is where you think things should be. And then that is gonna be something that can have an impact, um, obviously on how well that you process the world and how successful you are in certain aspects of what you're trying to do. Okay, so one of the things that we have um, that is interesting now is that there's a bunch of different technological advances that will kind of give an idea about how we can actually track vision and uh, ways that we can record eye movements. Uh, so there's a lot of different stuff. So you can you know monitor some of this. Some people have more advanced stuff than what I do. Um, basically, I have some pretty neat kind of tools. So some of you may have seen these before. These are basically the uh, goggles that I have that I can actually see people's eyes in the dark. You put, a, put them on like this and you can actually see the eyes moving in the dark. You can see the um, people going back and forth, but you can also record that so you can kind of figure out how well things are going later on. Um, there's a bunch of different stuff that kind of goes with it, but you know, what? I'm going to show you guys an idea of like what some of this stuff looks like. So, um, you know, hopefully this doesn't freak you out too much because this is, um, you know, a big version of eyes and these are my eyes, but this is some of the things that you can see with some of the movements that are actually available. So let me pull this up on the screen here. So if you look at this. Again, there's a lot of different stuff that you can see with somebody's eyes. Here, let me, uh, let's see here, I'll go, there we go. So basically when you end up having this kind of stuff, you can see the eyes and you should be able to follow the pointer that I have over here. I've got this on this other screen here, so I'm gonna be looking off to the side if you're looking at me. But these are you know, what you can have with different eye movements. Eyes should be moving together um, and there are different kinds of movements that should happen. So when people's eyes move, like for example, like you can talk about smooth eye movements or you can talk about like jumpy eye movements. This is an example of what should happen when somebody has a smooth eye movement. So if you are looking at somebody and if you are following a target and your eyes are going back and forth, you should be able to smoothly follow it with your eyes. So if you look at this, this is kind of nice because you can see how the eyes are smoothly moving back and forth. What you would look for on somebody is like for the eyes to be jumpy when it's like this. Now, this is me switching it into another program where I'm going up and down. Again, you can see that the eyes should be tracking generally up and down. There shouldn't be a lot of left and right movement. I, I had a little bit there, but um, you should see the eyes going smoothly up and down. It shouldn't be a lot of jumping when it comes to this. 
you can see here, I'm just basically trying to get to another, the next set. So when I look at this and here in a second, I'm going to start looking. So this is a saccade where you're going to be looking at a eye jumping from one target to another target. And this is a really, really fast movement. It should be something that should be accurate and it shouldn't be corrected. So one of the things that you're really not seeing a lot of is when I am jumping from side to side, you're not typically seeing my eyes jump and then having to jump again. So there's quick movements. It has to be accurate. It has to be fast. That's the kind of thing that you want to do. And then you can have other times of movement where you can end up having your eyes bouncing as they start to move. So this is a nystagmus where it ends up being a, a pursuit type of a movement and then a little bit of a jump. So this is just some of the things that you can kind of see with what how things kind of work. So you can see that the eyes are basically doing a bouncing when I do something like this. This is where I'm following a target back and forth. And again, this is another way to do it. So there's multiple different ways to assess the eyes and how things should be working. And I just figured that I should show you guys a little bit of, you know, some of the things that you can do because you can assess these things. Um, you can have like more expensive type of technology that actually graphs them out and tells you like speed and stuff like that. That's something that I don't have, but you know, I'd like it. It'd be nice, but there's a bunch of different stuff that happens when it comes to, um, you know, again, all of these technological advances. So, but because of all this stuff, you end up having um, ways that you can track how well that somebody's actually performing. Um, you can kind of see visually and just kind of compare, you know, time to time to see how many times that somebody might have had an interruption with their movement. So, if the movement is going and it jumps five times and it used to jump 10 times and now it jumps five times, that can give you an idea that the person's actually improving. So uh, when it comes to this type of stuff of what we're talking about here, this neurovisual training or neurovisual therapy or neurovision training you, that can go by a bunch of different things. This is basically one of the ways that you can have, you're using vision in order to try to drive the brain in order to make things work a little bit better. So this is some of the stuff that does happen in optometry. Again, you start looking at sport vision training, and then there's other brain training aspects that kind of come together. So this can be used for a, a handful of different things, but again, you can help to improve the speed at which the brain is processing information. And that can be good for somebody who is an athlete, obviously, but that's also going to be a good thing for other things like somebody that maybe had a concussion. So again, vision is going to be one of the ways, obviously one of the, one of the primary senses that we use, um, you know, in general, it's one of the one of the primary senses that actually drives development. It's not to say that somebody can't develop without vision. It's just saying that it is one of the primary ways that we actually drive development and how you have um, have things progress. Um, again, it's going to a vision is going to account to somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of the sensory processing type of information. Um, the demands that you have during the sports activity and different multiple different studies basically show that visual function is going to be directly related to athletic performance. Again, you have to be able to see the ball, process it, make sure that you actually know where it is in space and then go get it. Or you have to see something happen, make a decision and then do something else. Basically, every sport is going to involve some type of, you know, that aspect. Some of them are going to have different components and we'll get into them a little bit later. But again, you have multiple different things. Some of it's more reacting. Some of it is thinking about what you need to do and processing from there. Um, again, the neurovisual approach. Um, again, you aim to combine multiple different techniques to look for different weaknesses and then try to improve performance. So Again, it's not just performance. Like I said, again, the sports vision therapy is going to be something that you can use for concussion management. And one of the ways that you can assess the ability to actually like predict injury risks. So one of the things that's interesting is that there was basically a study done in the Air Force with basically with like airmen with pilots and stuff like that. So the idea was, is that, you know, they, they have this thing called battle vision, which is basically a program. They did an experiment with 33 different airmen in order to figure out whether or not this visual training type of stuff works. And basically when you look at the data, the results 
are kind of dramatic. They show that the airmen who were trained on this battle vision program improved their scores by 65%, while the scores of the people who were not trained had dropped by about 69%. And there's a major difference between the two of them on how the people had performed um, when, when obviously when it came to the beginning versus the end. So improving scores is one thing. And again, the, the scores on just a video game type of a test isn't like that big of a deal. But if you start talking about doing visual training and trying to improve, like the, the whole point is gonna to be to try to improve how people perform in a sport. So the idea is, is that if you take this brain training and if you see if you can improve playing ability, that's what they did for a different study. So uh, they took, uh, there was 17 different, um, basically high school baseball players that were participating in a 25 minute per day exercise. So they were doing eye exercises 25 minutes to, per day over the course of a month. And during the study, the eyesight had improved by about 30% on the visual acuity test. So that's going down and looking at the different lines and figuring out if somebody you know, is you know, with the eye chart to, to figure out if somebody has 20-20 vision versus 20-10 vision or whatever. So again, people that are doing the exercises had an improvement in their um, visual acuity. The, the team, so this uh, high school team had improved during the season, they increased the number of games that they won. Um, they, they won about five more games than what they typically did. So when you talk about the average, you know, over multiple different years, they won five more games than what they typically did, which is a big deal. But more importantly, the players who ended up doing, well, not more importantly, but the players who ended up doing some of the training actually improved their own stats more than players on teams that didn't have that training. So, you know, again, batting average going up, on base percentage going up, you know, fielding, you know, all that other kind of stuff, all those different categories that you can look at when it comes to baseball. You know, again, I'm not going to say every single one of them went up, but you had a significant improvement when it came to the stats that you had for the players. So that ends up being a big deal. Um, so you, let's look a little bit more into some of the different exercises and what uh, what types of vision that you're actually talking about having an impact on. So one of them is going to be called focus flexibility. So when it comes to focus flexibility, the idea is going to be shifting between having something that is a close object versus something that's far away. So if you talk about something that's, you know, again, you don't want to get it too close, but if you have something that's maybe, you know, six to 10 inches away from your nose versus something that's 20 feet away or 15 feet away. To shift between looking at something that's far away and then having something come back a little bit closer to you, that ends up being a, that, that's a task. It's a ment it can be a mentally draining task. Now granted, this is what happens basically in high school and in college when somebody is in a classroom and you're going from writing at your desk to looking at what's on the board and writing back and forth. Again, you have to change your focus when you're doing that. So that is focus flexibility. It has the tendency to be that when somebody gets older, the focus flexibility ends up decreasing. So this is the idea of like somebody needing longer arms in order to hold something further away from them um, because you can't get up close, but things are also kind of slow down. So this is where people might need reading glasses when they get over the age of 40 or they start having like bifocals or trifocals or different stuff like that um, in order to help to kind of constant to, to compensate for what you have that's going on. Um, again, this also ends up being a huge issue for people that have concussion. I, I've had patients on a regular basis who they get concussion. And then when they talk about like their visual field, things end up being off. So something that ends up being far away, it takes them multiple seconds in order for them to change their vision to be able to have something come into focus. That's obviously problematic. You want something to be fairly quick to go back and forth with that. So one of the ways that you can actually improve this, you know, again, most of these things are things that you can actually like work on improving. But one of the ways that you can do this is you can have something that, again, trying to have text that's about the same size. So whether or not it was like a text or a magazine or something like that, and basically something that you could see if it was, you know, maybe 15 feet away from you. So, you know, maybe not super tiny print in a magazine, but if you could take something and basically 
tape it up to a wall, for, let's say, right? So if you tape it up to a wall and then you have a similar page and then you're basically going back and forth between the two of them. So if you're talking about reading something that's here and then looking off at a distance, you know, and you basically are gonna be going in between the two where you're gonna read over there and then you're gonna read here. You're gonna read over there, then you're gonna read here. This would be an example of something that, you know, I have in my office that I'll give to people where, again, if you can see here, this has a bunch of different letters and stuff like that that's going to be associated with it. Hopefully, maybe it's backwards for you guys. Who knows? I can see it's backwards, but um, you know, my screen is mirrored right now. But again, you can see something like this. This is an easy thing that I can sit here and I can look at this and I can say, okay, I'm going to read an H here. And then over on that is going to end up being an A. And then you're going to go back and forth. And how many um, rows can you get in a minute? Or how, um, you know, how, how far can you get down? So again, that's something that you can speed up. You can focus your attention and change your tasks back and forth. And again, this is something that people can work on. So again, you focus, you switch it back and forth. Um, uh, obviously, that is something that can be trained. Um, peripheral awareness is another thing that you can end up having um, when, when you look at how well that people's visual system is working. So again, peripheral awareness is going to be the ability to perceive what's going on at either side of you without turning your head. So the idea is, is that can you see something that's off in some other direction when you're looking straight ahead and can you kind of pay attention to what's going on there? So again, you can test your peripheral awareness. You know, this is where, you know, like if you're getting your um, driver's license test and you're pushing the thing in and you're looking at the visual acuity, they'll have a flashing light that'll be going off on one side and you'll have to tell them that it's on the right or on the left with wherever the flashing light pops up. Because again, you need to be able to see peripherally when you're driving so that you can hopefully avoid accidents. So again, poor peripheral vision um, is going to be particularly dangerous to athletes. Again, you can have slower reaction time. Again, if you are a football player and somebody is coming in from the side in order to block you and you can't see them, then you're going to take a hit. Um, and it could be a big hit that you're not expecting and that you're not braced for. And then, you know, something that's on someone else's highlight reel, which you don't want. So again, that can put yourself at a higher risk of uh, injury. And again, like I said, specifically when you're talking about some kind of a contact sport or anything that's coming off from a different direction or other types of movements or players or just positional awareness. If you're talking about being a basketball player and if you're focused on one spot, but you see a player that's open in a different place, again, you can hopefully get the ball to them so that they can score. So again, there's multiple different things that kind of goes with that. Again, you can test your peripheral vision. So when it comes down to it, again, basically, if you sit, you know, you kind of like get a comfortable distance away from an object, basically what you're going to do is you're going to take your hands and you can bring your hands out to the side and figure out if I'm looking, like, let's say if I'm looking straight at you and if I'm straight ahead here, I can wiggle my fingers and I can find a specific kind of place where, okay, I can see right here. So it's not at 90 degrees, it's a little bit in front of that. So maybe it's like 85 degrees from wherever it is that I'm looking, I can see a little bit of movement. That's being aware of it, right? But you can start working on improving that as well. Again, um, basically, you know, you can go back and forth, you could improve it by trying to, you know, like if the television is off to the side, you know, and again, depends on, you know, it doesn't have to be like your favorite show or anything like that. But if you can kind of like pay attention and watching TV by watching off to the side, if you are watching TV, right? So not looking straight at it and letting your eyes bounce around the screen, but looking off to the side, but then paying attention through your peripheral vision to see what's going on and see what you can make out, right? So there's a couple of different things that you can do with that. You know, visual acuity is going to be being able to see in detail. So dynamic is going to be being able to see visual detail while you're moving, right? So somebody can have perfect vision when something is completely still, but when an object is in motion, it's going to be a lot harder. Your eyes have to track it. They have to track it well. They have to be like spot on. Um, or if you're moving and something is staying still, you need to be able to track it. So again, during visual training, um, and athletes can be asked to 
take objects and things that might be moving across the computer screen, um, something where um, you know, they're watching something and something is going to either flash by them. Um, and again, you can cut out letters, you can stick them on a, a turntable and try to identify records at different speeds. So you could take something like this, right? And you could basically try to identify things popping up. Again, not everybody's going to have a turntable, but something along those lines. You know, you can recognize things or shapes or different types of things. Um, but while it's in a motion and while it's kind of moving around. Um, so there's different ways that you can do that. Depth perception is another thing that you can end up having um, that you can, again, you can train and you can help with. Um, so depth perception is gonna enable you to determine obviously the distance of an object. So how far away it is from you. Um, obviously you're making spatial judgments uh, when you're doing that. And that's going to be crucial, not only with sport, but with driving and other kinds of stuff. You need to have an idea of how far away something is to make sure that you're actually driving. And again, because of some of these di different issues, like driving at night ends up being an issue because people's depth perception is lacking when they're driving at night. And then it causes problems with the ability to actually like stop in time. Again, good deal of the ability is going to be dependent on physical characteristics. So again, the spacing between your eyes is going to be one thing. Um, the method for testing it is basically identifying objects or shapes that are in randomized dot pattern backgrounds. Depth perception is something that it's, are your eyes actually pointing where they should be pointing? Because if you're trying to look at something that is this far away from you and one is pointing directly at it and the other eye is kind of off a little bit, then you're brain isn't going to be able to make a good picture of where it is and you could be shutting different parts of your vision down so it's making sure that people don't have suppression of some of their you know vision whether or not it's one eye or the other depending on what it is that they do so um, again you can basically go through and you can um, try to work on depth perception by like, for one example, you could take a straw, right? So if you have like a straw, something that's gonna be a little bit longer coming away and you could either put it someplace or you can have a friend actually like put it out there. And then if you have a toothpick, try to put the toothpick into the end of the straw. That's gonna be one way that you can have a impact on depth perception and trying to improve someone's depth perception. All right, so uh, color vision. Color vision is gonna be another thing that you're gonna be dealing with. So again, um, when the, you know, color vision can be important, you know, again, contrast and like when you're looking for um, a ball where, you know, a ball on a field, you know, something is um, being able to distinguish red from green. Um, obviously, if you have a red ball in a green field and the person ends up having a color problems, that can be an issue. Um, so obviously you can test, you can look at the dotted cards that end up having like the 21 or the 17 or the different stuff like that. Um, and again, there's not necessarily gonna be a way that you can target color enhancement, but making sure that you know that you end up having a, an issue with either being colorblind or whatever, that can be something that might be able to be fixed with um, eyewear or contact lenses or other kinds of things, depending on what the sport is. So knowing what those are, issues are, again, making sure that you can actually like differentiate that can end up being helpful as well. Eye hand dominance is going to be another one. So the idea is, is that most of us have a dominant eye where it's the main eye that we kind of like pay attention to. So this is going to be, you know, like important in sports like baseball. It's going to be important if a person is shooting or different stuff like that. Um, again, basically people have the tendency to kind of like have one eye dominant and then one hand dominant. And again, people will have like a dominant ear and even a dominant foot. Um, most of the time they're all on the same side. So people that are right-handed typically have a right eye dominant and the right ear dominant and right foot dominant, but that's not always the case. Um, so making sure that, um, you know, that you can process things that are from your dominant eye and work on the other one. And obviously to improve like the, the speed with how fast that you can um, pick up things is obviously something that's there. Um, so, um, so there, you know, 
there, there's a handful of different things there. So visual concentration is another one. Visual concentration is your ability to, to ignore distractions that are happening around you. We all have this reflex that happens that if you see something that's going on, if I'm like, look over here at my nose and something starts moving in the side or if a light starts to, to flicker or something like that, we have this tendency to basically look at this new information. But if you can basically suppress that reflex, then again, that's going to be one way that you can work on concentration. So visual concentration is that ability to ignore distractions that are happening around you. So eyes are naturally going to react to movement. Um, again, there's some times where you want your eyes to be on a, like, uh, you know, your head on a swivel in order to see things coming at you, whether or not it's peripheral vision or whatever, but there's going to be some times that you're going to want to be able to work on visual concentration. Um, you know, again, while you can end up having, you know, different stuff where, you know, like this would be like the ability to, you know, continue to study when something is loud. Again, not only visual, but it's also auditory too. So you can have things that are loud. You can have people trying to distract you, you know, like again, you know, perfect example of visual concentration is going to be somebody in basically any sport or any basketball game where you end up having fans that are sitting behind the actual hoop. You know, everybody's basically going to be trying to distract whoever it is that's shooting the free throw. Right. So, again, trying to work on all you're doing is paying attention to the hoop. You're paying attention to getting the, the ball in. You know, that is obviously, you know, somebody working on visual concentration. Um, so that's basically that. Um, so eye tracking, again, eye tracking is the ability to follow an object with your eyes without having head motion. And it's also not having the eyes accurately track. So again, if I'm looking and something is moving across screen, I don't want that thing that as it moves across screen for it to like slow down. I want it to be tracking basically back and forth with wherever it's moving. You don't want something to move and then have somebody's eyes have to jump in order to follow whatever it is that they're doing. And so that's again, something that can be improved any type of sport where you end up having fast moving objects you know whether or not it's people or balls or whatever again you have to be able to track with your eyes and if you can improve that eye tracking the eye tracking will also help to improve your balance it can improve your reaction time as well so if you know where it is you can actually get your hand out to it and stop the ball or catch it or do whatever so again working on eye tracking again you can watch the flight of a ball while keeping a book balanced on your head so that's one thing so you can take like balls and different stuff like that and you can try to keep balance and then try to follow the ball in in different ways in order to do different types of catching when it comes to a ball uh, visual memory, the ability to process and remember a fast moving complex picture of people and things is described as visual memory. So again, this is going to be important in basketball and hockey and soccer, uh, things along those lines where the game is moving up the field and you're remembering where either where people are or where people were. Um, visual memory helps the athletes know the positions of teammates and their opponents. And again, being aware of your space, but then knowing where people are. To improve your visual memory, another one that you can do is you can take a magazine, look at a magazine uh, page for a second, turn the page, and then try in your mind to reconstruct the image that you just saw, right? So um, basically just, okay, you know, like what is the, you know, this would be basically like the, the version of Jason Bourne, right? So, you know, looking at, you know, uh, or if you watch Psych, you know, the idea of being able to look into a scene, shut your eyes, you know, and again, in those kind of things, there are more extreme versions of it, but you would go into something and you could like pay attention to something for a split second, shut your eyes and then say, okay, there's a person over there with a blue baseball cap. There's a person over here with a red jacket, you know, and then kind of reconstructing your space of where you are. Again, all of this stuff can be, it can be complex, you know, in a 3D space, like what I was just describing, where you can make it a little bit easier and you can do, and, you know, the idea of, you know, seeing a picture on the internet, right? Um, you know, if you were to look at a picture on the internet, look at it for five seconds, and then give yourself five seconds to try to reconstruct the image in your mind. So that's another thing that you can do. There is visual reaction time. So visual reaction time is going to be the idea of, seeing something 
and processing and either getting your hand up or whatever. So it's the speed at which your brain is gonna interpret and react. So again, you know, when you talk about visual reaction is gonna be important when a batter is trying to hit a ball or a tennis player is trying to return a, a hard serve. To improve your visual reaction time, again, you can go back and forth and you can toss uh, a ball where you stand with your back to a friend. And again, these are things that they do in sports for like receivers and stuff like that, where you say now, and when you hear the word now, you turn around and then you catch the ball when it's there. You can even do it when it's like in the air, right? So again, it all depends on how far away and everything else that somebody is, but you can say, you know, like throw the ball and it's part way there. And you say, now the person turns around and they reach out and they catch the ball. Right. Again, it doesn't need to be anything that's crazy. It can end up being something that is maybe, a, um, you know, maybe it's not a football and a wide receiver trying to do this, but it could be a baseball and a baseball player doing the same kind of thing, reaching out and trying to catch it with a glove. But you can also use something like, you know, pool balls, right. Or not pool balls, but like, um, you know, like a ball pit ball or something like that. Something that's you know, not going to be heavier if somebody gets beamed in the head with this, you know, this isn't necessarily going to be something that's really going to hurt anybody, right? So having that visual reaction time, um, doing that and being able to not only reach out and catch it, but if you have something that's thrown and you end up having a triangle, or maybe you end up having a square that's drawn on the ball, and the person has to not only catch the ball, but they have to catch the ball and then they have to identify what it was that was on the ball at the same time, right? Another way that you can even do it is that you can end up getting one of these, which is, these are pretty cool little balls, which basically you can do something where I can say, if it shows up and it, when it bounces, if it turns blue, then you catch it, catch it with both hands. If it turns red, you're gonna catch it with your right hand. And if it turns green, you're gonna catch it with your left. And this one, hopefully you can see when it, so you can see that it flashes different colors when it actually hits. So you can bounce the ball on the ground and a person can catch it either barehanded or if you're talking about baseball or something, they can catch it with a glove. They can even play with themselves and have like a brick wall and just bounce it off of the wall and do the exact same thing. You can add other fun stuff where you're dealing with, um, you know, the visual like processing speed. So you can start doing math problems with this kind of stuff too, where if it's green, it is worth a one. So if it bounces off the wall and it's green and I yell out as I throw it, I yell out a two and you make them add them together. So it's a one plus a two equals three. And that's what the person has to do the math in their head. So there's a handful of different things that you can do in order to um, improve all of these reaction times and all of this other stuff. So the thing to remember though, is that when it comes to this, not every skill is gonna need improving. There's gonna be some types of things that depending on the sport and depending on the goals, a person isn't necessarily going to need a, um, you're not going to need to have um, everything be like, you know, ramped up to 11. Again, it depends. You want, if something is slow and somebody that has like a concussion or something like that, ideally you want to get up to, you know, basically like a normal type of a level, but these don't all need to be, you know, pushed in and everything else. So like, um, you know, so for one example, again, if you start talking about like contrast or, you know, the ability to see or like processing some of the stuff, um, you know, tennis players are going to need excellent high, like hand eye coordination, but the idea of being able to perceive contrast isn't necessarily that big of a deal, right? Whereas if you're talking about team sports, that's going to be more peripheral awareness. If you're talking about basketball, that's going to be peripheral awareness to know like where team members are and be able to get the ball to them. Um, you know, if you're talking about uh, the ability to perceive contrast, that's going to be important for somebody who's skiing to make sure that they actually know where their paths are because everything isn't going to be like the Olympics and have like blue dye down the sides of it in order to know where everything is. So there's a handful of different things that are like that. 